The archetypal kind of framework that people can all relate to. I think that's where his Christology... Could, couldn't we... I mean, if we were to stretch it that far, the way that you explained it, and you're saying that he's fine in doing that, then we could also say that Harry Potter is another archetype. Yeah. And that is a true yeah. story. Yeah. yeah. But the problem there is... No, 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 hang on. We wouldn't say it was a true story. The dynamics a true from a pragmatic point of view. It's happening now. Okay, sorry. So you're using truth as opposed to factual. I'm, I'm yeah, using yeah, his yeah, definition. Yeah, yeah. So what's happening in that school... I, I mean, I haven't read Harry Potter. I haven't seen the film either. But whatever the name of that school is, I've heard the name of the school. Um, um, so th that is happening right now in Speaker's Corner. You know, between um, Harry and whatever the other witches or whatever they are. Um, you can tell I, I haven't read the book. Um, that's happening right now between me and Tony, between me and Christian. Yeah. Do you yeah, see? Yeah, sure. And the problem there is that it's stretched so far, you can't actually identify as anything. You can't, if you're asking the question, what is objectively and historically true, you've got to identify what is your key question. I'm, I'm always saying this. Your answer can only be as good as your question. What is your key question? The key question I'm always asking is how should I live? Okay? That's my first question. Right. Okay? Now, if that's not your first question, we're inevitably going to end up coming up with different answers. What if I was to say, how do I know what's true? Well, I would say that if I ask the question, very good, if I would say that if I ask the question, how should I live, almost instantly it invites the next question, how do I know what's true? Okay? But the question, how do I live, is the motive behind asking that next question. But it can also be the other way around. It could be. So, great. So, in, in the hierarchy of which of those questions is primary, I think how do I live is more primary because I think how do I live is an eternal question that every human being who's ever been born or whoever will be born will have to face. And which is precisely why the religions in all cultures have generated answers to that core in, uh, question. And one of the next questions it then invites inevitably is how do you know? what the hell's going on? Yeah? However, the issue there is if you start off with your question, uh -huh. pragmatism is the paradigm, my question would be a correspondence theory of truth. That would be your paradigm. I'm, I'm not anti-correspondence theory at all. I'm not saying you are. I'm saying th there's, there'll be two different paradigms from which you start if the questions are in that order. I'm saying that I think you've got to, you've got to separate your inevitabilities from your options, from your contingencies. Yeah? Right. And I think asking the question, how do I live, is an inevitable question for all human beings for all time. You ask it unconsciously. It doesn't have to be articulated. Same, same with the, how do I know what's true? This is your... Okay, on that one you're right, but that very quickly we do start moving into questions of physics and metaphysics. So you don't inevitably have to engage with in order to answer the question, how do I live? Yeah? It's, it's an advantage to, no question, but it's not absolutely inevitable. If you're a wise person, you will, but yeah. you don't have to. But you are compelled to make choices. I have no choice but to make choices, so I've got to ask primarily, on what basis do I make choices? You're right, then you try and work out where am I, what are the rules, what's going on. Um, you seem to be framing your stuff within trying to nail down objective reality and I just it's a statement of faith almost if you really think that you what, but don't you think don't you think all world views start off from some level of faith yeah I think this is the point we know yeah. from the so we agree before, that? yeah Gödel's incompleteness theory human's fallacy of induction quantum physics they all show that there are limits to epistemologically what you can grasp yeah. you shouldn't conclude from that the epistemo um, epistemology has no merit or it isn't the most powerful tool. It's an incredibly powerful tool. It's just not a universal tool. Yeah. So once you understand that, you realize, as Peterson does, that there'll come a point when you have, when that tool is no longer available to you, at the higher echelons of your experience, you're going to have to go with faith. You're going to have to go with intuition. Yeah. And then you can pragmatically look back and see how it went, which is why he says, I'll look for the shining example in other people. Yeah. You're going to have to make a leap of faith, act it out, I'll look at you and see if your leap of faith worked. And if it does, then you may have been heading in the right direction. So at some level... We but it, this, uh, Yeah, sorry, Karen. No, Karen. Well, at some level you've ground down in pragmatism because there's nowhere honest left to go but that. Uh, so the last part I don't agree with because you would still, for, for Jordan Peterson to decide by I look at the followers, he still has to have a criteria to decide these followers are flourishing, these are not. And that criteria has nothing to do with the question that he's trying to answer. Okay, yeah, no, we're in the eternal loop here. Again, he has to have faith. So that's fine. So yeah. we, we agree there. Yeah, I that, think all we've yeah. got to do is structure our arguments where we agree, whether you're an atheist or not, your argument will include statements of faith. Now the that includes values, which you yeah, 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 down to, what, did I exist? I think very shortly into the second century, did 
Christ exist? Did this person even exist in human form? Lots of the earliest Christian fathers were having that argument with other Christians, other Gnostics and so on. The, what's cool about this though is it looks like Sayings Gospels and reading Sayings Gospels? Sayings, like Sayings Gospels okay, sure. and reading into scripture, Old Testament scripture was where a lot of these guys got their idea from Christ from, I think Isaiah 53, you know, the suffering, um, suffering hero story. Um, I think what's important is that you take, say if you're listening to the parables Christ teaches, you listen to many of the ways he's, he's saying powerful moral stuff, it's just as important today as it was back then. And um, the, the parables, again, are, are, they appear to be kind of timeless. They never really, you don't need to change them. We're making movies, we, we do Hollywood films today, which are based in, in large part on, on kind of Christian, on those stories. If you take the patriarchs as well, yeah, the, the Lion King and so on. Um, like uh, Star Wars is a good example of stories that are actually based on the kernel of... Anakin is happening right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what, yeah. it's quite obviously <laughs> esoteric and strange, right? But but, but the, those stories are encapsulated stuff and truths that are going to be eternal. I think that's what Peterson is trying to, to get yeah, at, Yeah, I really. think Peterson understands that, and we had this discussion before, I think truth can exist in fiction. Yeah, and if you're that's willing where to I accept the truth, you disagree. Now remember, I, I believe in correspondence theory. So I believe in correspondence theory. No, but I believe correspondence theory in terms of your beliefs, your values. Um, it, it's not like, you, for example, you would use correspondence theory if you want to know what's the best way of bulking up your muscles, right? So you'd look at scientific studies about protein synthesis and all this stuff. But when it comes to religion, you would use a pragmatic view. No, 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 no. I, we're misunderstanding each other fundamentally, okay? okay? I think in the hierarchy, pragmatism is below correspondence theory. Okay? Okay, I know that sounds strange. I think pragmatism That's is good. below it. Okay, good. However, I because I too. think correspondence theory is based on epistemology, Come in. Yeah, it means there's limits to how far it can take. Okay, That's one caveat. The other caveat is, and it's a small print caveat, I was going to put the self-consistency principle above correspondence theory, because I think correspondence theory only looks for self-consistency in the present moment empirically. Right. That's really what it aims for, whereas the self-consistency principle, you can project it into the future. In other words, it's even more powerful than correspondence theory. I'm actually bigging up correspondence theory. So as a practical example, I... Wouldn't you say that they're linked? I, I think... Because being consistent is part of the... Part of a yeah, they're both, they're both linked in Plato's right. principle. Do you mind if I get Faisal to join yeah, yeah, this conversation? Yeah, yeah. No. You see, he has a lot of very interesting things to say, but he just doesn't. Yeah, no, he's, talk. I know. We've I'll chatted before. To, to say, go on, come, come. Okay. No, just to come listen. Come so listen. I think we'd all be at, we're all anchored in Plato's principle of self consistency. Yeah? Yeah. That when there's a, a contradiction between any two situations in the system, then there's a problem. And the problem is either one of perception or the system itself. Yeah? Yeah. So we agree with that. Yeah. Therefore, the principle of correspondence theory makes perfect sense, and I agree with correspondence theory. I just think we're undervaluing its power, and that the principle I'm of undervaluing, undervaluing, it's undervaluing, it's undervaluing, undervaluing okay. its power. Okay. Because I, my understanding of correspondence theory is it's about saying, if in the here and now, everything is self-consistent, I can trust that. I think you can go further and predict into the future, and that's beyond correspondence theory. That self-consistency. You're just going, I have so much faith in self-consistency, I just don't think it's going to play out in the present. I'm confident it will play out in the future. So on the periodic table, they predicted what elements would appear in the yeah. future because they were so confident of self-consistency in the universe. Now, that didn't tally with self-consistency for them in the moment, yeah? But because they put real jackboots on the self-consistency principle, they went, well, hedge our bets in the future that this element will appear here, this element will appear here. Ditto with the Higgs boson and this still happens. So I have huge faith in correspondence theory, but it still has cognitive limitations. They all do. Correspondence, right. coherence, Excellent. semantic, they all do. Excellent. Yeah. And when should we, know. because we labored this point, should we move on to the other points? Sure. Yeah. Which one? So you had epistemology and after that you had something else. Because um, there, there's quite a few points you raised in there and I thought it'd be good to go through them. We had the epistemology, we had because in many ways we we had a similar conversation before. It's rained all over. It's <laughs> rained oh, all over yeah. the notes. It's okay. Well, we we actually we were covering them. We had the Cain and a, the, the objective reality versus mythological reality. Yeah. yeah? We which we were talking about. Yeah. We had the epistemology. 
which hopefully we've understood. Okay, what about the third one? The third one was the use of postmodernism. Because Good. they both seem when, at some point in the discussion, uh, Peterson said, what does the phrase, do you believe in God, mean? Yeah? Yeah. And then he started deconstructing, it depends what you mean by you, what you mean by God, etc. Yeah? Yeah. And they both seemed to concur that that was a postmodern thing to do. And there I left it. I departed from both of them, because to me that's just healthy scepticism. You were telling me last week about a postmodern book you were reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it makes perfect sense, right? Because from my understanding, postmodern is all about deconstructing... The so it makes perfect sense what... They were both saying that is yeah, postmodern. Uh, well, our former Hamid Jarvis was saying to John Peterson was, you know, I have this Carl Jungian methodological understanding of Christianity, right? They're saying it's metaphorically true, right? But because the church fathers never said it was metaphorically true, it was literally true. Like Muslims nowadays would hold literally true to the miracles that we have. So then he's saying, by you doing this Carl Jung mix of Christianity, you're kind of being a postmodernist. Right. Because postmodernists, it's what they do, right? They take these legitimate narratives and then delegitimize and talk about how every crisis and this and that. It's just all about deconstruction. I think postmodern in itself is incoherent. And I think in general philosophy, but I think the tools it uses are very amazing. Okay, so, so just before yeah. that, do you agree with him that what they were saying was not postmodernism? He thinks that's skepticism. I disagree with that. I think that was both right. That was, that was postmodernism. Okay, so so how, how, would you, how would you define postmodernism and how would he? I'm, I'm realising I'm not clear how to define it. I go back to Plato's cave. I assume in Plato's cave, Plato is saying, and then I'll go through Descartes and I think therefore I am. So in Plato's cave, it's established. You cannot trust your own senses. You cannot trust your own cognition. You're a self-deceiving animal, and that's the framework within which you're going to have to operate. Yeah. The solution to that is skepticism. The tool to use to counter that is skepticism. Well, I, yeah. I don't see why postmodernism is doing anything new. It's picking itself up as some kind of new thing. But actually, we know we have to question what we mean by the words. It's a very yeah, healthy it's, thing it's to do. It's a different type of skepticism, though. You're talking about Socratic skepticism, right? Yeah. Which is what the West is very big on. But postmodernists, like start in the 1960s, first of all, it's post-structuralist. When I talk about history, when I took history apart, I talk about history, it's all about narratives, Victor writes history, uh -huh. and uh, 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 all stories have these four kind of modes, it's either tragic, or it's this, or it's that, or that. They kind of these utilized narratives. And the postmodernists came after the post-structuralists, Michael Foucault, it took it even further, right? Mm -hmm. so Delegitimizing these modern notions, like of the prison system, of mental health, and la la, and so, they're both different forms of skepticism, right? That's what but, they do, but, but how cogent. But the point is that when Joe Peter says, when you say, do you believe in God? He goes, what do you mean by do? Because yeah. do is a very, like, I don't know, um, philosophical, metaphysical statement, right? Like, a yeah. theological statement. Or right? believe. Yeah, what happened? Then you. Well, who's the you? The I, the concept, philosophy again. I believe. Know. God. That is very postmodernist, in my opinion. Like, yeah. it's, it's deconstructing yeah. the yeah. sentence yeah. and, and talk about how he's, he's almost saying the question's not even legitimate, isn't it? Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? No, I mean, when I, I, I listen to postmodernist thinkers, I read a lot on postmodernism going back. I think there's a, there's a point where postmodernism kind of split from, say, Nietzsche was reasonable with Wittgenstein as well, who had some interesting things to say about right. language and linguistics and so on. When by the time you get to Foucault and you know the um, Frankfurt School and stuff, it just goes a bit nuts. And I think yeah. it was more a pol yeah, he was saying I'm, I'm endorsing more of a political kind of a political series of ideas that, that actually started to and I think intentionally were there to try and take down the American system, the Western system. We're actually in agreement because I'm not legitimizing postmodernism. Like I said, I think it's incoherent yeah. in, in, in general philosophy, right? Because yeah. it, br it brings about some conceptual problems. But postmodern is still a reality. Like here in America right now, they're doing around a critical race theory, they're doing you know, a gender yeah, theory, gender, right? Yeah, Trying to blur the lines between man and woman, right? It's all postmodernist, post structuralist, patriarchy, yeah. uh, so oppressed and left oppressed so narrative, right? Because postmodern, a lot of it is the oppressor and oppressed. Yeah. Kind of so, so, di so this is what Hijab was basically saying to him that when you're being um, when you've been criticizing postmodernism, you're using it yourself yeah. when you cannot answer a question about your theology. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, don't, I, I don't like it. I, I disagree with you, Tony. I think it's true. Like, yeah, so you it is, it's you easier to. Uh, yeah, I think it is easier just to use common parlance to to get to where you want to be. You know, and to and I, I think it. Wanna, can we define our terms quickly? What I mean by postmodernism, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe we're using the term differently, yeah? Which because you're describing to me in societal terms how postmodernists manifest. I don't care so much about that, I care about defining a form. A postmodernist is someone who thinks human beings are a blank slate. Can you remind yeah? me again, what was the thing that he, he the it retort was within from the 
it's set. Because I remember hearing it, I just can't remember. It's exactly. the eternal battle trying to pin down the objective proof of statements. So when you ask statements like, do you believe God exists? That predicates on an assumption that God can be stuck into an objective, logical box. And those of us who believe that God is, when we pray, when you pray in Islam, you say there is always something higher. I think you said God is the highest. Yeah, well, there is something above. So I assume that God is beyond, ineffable and beyond my own. Transcendent, yeah. Yeah, transcendent, yeah. And that therefore I don't expect to be able to fit God and various other concepts so, so into a box. There's a slight nuance here. So we're not supposed to reflect about God because you cannot grasp God's essence but we're supposed to reflect upon the creation of God because we can so we can ontologically affirm that there is a God there is a creator there's one worthy worship but the actual essence is beyond us so when someone is asked yeah. so this is why I believe when when Hijab asked that question it should have been an, e an easy enough answer I didn't, yeah. I didn't yeah. see the kind of that's exactly my point. That's exactly my point. So, are you a Christian or an atheist, it's easy by the way? Enough, especially for someone like Peterson, who is an intellectual. What definition of God is he supposed to be agreeing So, ju disagreeing? just before that, I want to know, are you an atheist or a Christian? I'm actually religious. You're religious. I'm so, it seems to be like... Maybe religious people want an answer and... Yeah, yeah, I believe in yeah, a, a I, I, deity. I'm a deist in... Oh, you're a deist? So okay. I'm not, I'm not, I, I you're believe I believe uh, in God, absolutely. I do believe there is creation. There's a consciousness behind creation. I, I am interested very much in esoteric religion and philosophy and in Christianity, the way it's manifested in Christianity. Like the Gnostics and... Yeah, kind of. Right. So Tony, um, sorry, just to answer your question. Yeah? That's Tony, that's Christian. Yeah, yeah. I'm Christian, yeah? Yes. Nice to meet you. So, once again, I think Hijab was right to his postmodernist because both post-structuralists and postmodernists have the same notion that reality has no intrinsic nature. That's the notion of the work, the, the, the principle, they the good of philosophy of, right? And then I start talking about everyone has these legitimized narratives to bring forth their uh, na uh, uh, narratives so you're saying that as, defined, as a will to power. You're saying that's, that's generally, that's, no, well, I think that's, that's like a academic understanding of that thing. Post-structuralists and post-modernists, both of them. I think what post-modernists is like second phase of post-structuralists, what well, defines postmodernism, Michael Foucault and these a lot, uh -huh. is that they are interrogating modern paradigms. Yeah. That's what they do. That's why they're kind of different because postmodernists all about modern, and it's like this systematic interrogation of these legitimizing narratives and so on and so forth. So when John Peterson is saying, "What do you mean by do? What do you mean by you? What do you mean by believe?" John Peterson is almost saying this statement is illegitimate and let's interrogate, it, right? Which is very postmodernist thing to yeah, do nowadays. Yeah. So I think it is postmodernist. You, you could all, you could say until it's on the brink of logical positivism. Because right. you know, remember the logical positivists, they had this idea that if something's not mathematical or mathematically you, you can show it or empirically, then it's almost meaningless. Right. He's not doing that, but he's close to that by almost saying like, well, we can't really get down to the nitty gritty. Like what, what he said is when we get down to, I don't remember his exact words, but believe and uh, the uh, no, one other word he mentioned he said if we think we can define them we, we can't or something like this he said yeah, yeah. and i believe, I believe that, you know, language has a meaning it is so useful and we've harmonized and, and evolved our language to such a point now when someone asks do you believe in god it's kind of yes or no answer you know yeah. and you can you can drill into the weeds with that right but yeah, I mean, it, I think Peterson, I think, understands it, and he will realise that there's a, an inherent a beauty within man, and I think God-like, if you get things right, a kind of God-like nature in, in humanity itself, and the idea of a, a creation that has order, you know, that has a formal order to it, and that's what he talks about a lot. Again, of course, I think he believes this stuff. Um, but, but, and I, I get where maybe he doesn't believe in bearded, white bearded guy. I don't think anybody does. Exactly. <laughs> well, you um, believe in objective truth. You believe in objective facts, which um, he but we don't probably dispute. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, th I think graying the error just because the guy used. Okay, so that, that's a good point. Just because the guy used the logical positivist stance for a minute. No, he did. I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying. Box. I'm not saying he used it. I'm saying he got close to it. Yeah, but he's allowed to. It's a tool that you can use. It's just a logical positivist. They use it to the exclusion of all else. That was a problem. Skepticism is a perfectly good tool. It shouldn't be used to the exclusion of all else. You want to use the toolkit. But he didn't answer the question. I know, because the question may in itself be an invalid question. Because no, 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 it's, no, I'm not. 
No, I'm not accepting that label. My, the way I'm looking at postmodernism yeah. is in the context of human nature itself. And for me, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll give you my definition, maybe we need a new word. The world divides into two kinds of people. People who think that human beings are blank slates and people who think that human beings arrive with an a priori nature. Okay? Yeah? yeah that's philosophy, but I don't think... Okay, fine, fine. Right. Now, I'll, now I'll map postmodernism into that because no postmodernism it sprawls all over the place and I'm not a fan of it, okay? But my understanding position would be, yeah, you're a blank slate, right? That, that they would engage. Whereas religious people of all faiths and Darwinians, we all believe yeah, that yeah. humans arrive with an a priori nature. Mm -hmm. right. So to cut through the Gordian knot of this constant talking about sociology and stuff, I really don't care about. Okay, so, so I'm using that core okay. definition. Yeah, so yes. you made you made a very interesting point, which Thank is you. interestingly enough, theists and Darwinists believe in we, yeah, we have an inherent the same yeah camp. a priori beliefs, and then you have the standard social science model, the yes. blank slate model. So Peterson clearly is using the language of the standard social science model but the audience that he's pandering to they believe in a priori beliefs. yes so he's allowed to he's he's made it no, very but, very clear but there's a problem there isn't a priori no i don't see a problem he definitely believes in a priori human nature he believes oh, wait, wait, wait. He, you said he definitely believes in that nature yeah. okay. but he's not being asked the question do you believe in a priori I, i'm not i'm not, I'm not, I'm not challenging God. you here but i'm saying okay. i'm just interested how what made you think he believes that because I don't I see everything. Oh, okay. Everything that. I've ever seen the guy yeah. said confirms that perspective. I think he I has agree. an understanding there okay. of okay. the 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 genetics and genes being important in a person's development, and this is obviously no, no, no. That's in that's in regards to the yeah. feminism yeah. discussions. We're talking about a prior, like no, for no, example, no, we have I mean, an a prior um, belief in God. Like slate that, that versus. Don't bring God into the minute. Just on psychology. Just the fact no, that. No, of course he has that. If he's got an a, he if he's got an a pro, if he thinks that even like in, in relation to like a blank slate kind of theory of humans and stuff, obviously he, he believes in genes to a point, but he also believes environments very important for humans. Marry marry those together, you've got basically a template for what a human. Yeah. Would so look, like look, look, look he, he believes we have a biological inheritance. We have our yeah. cognitive yeah. architecture, yeah. which yeah. makes women act this way men act that way but when we speak about a priori beliefs as theists we're not referring to those things we're referring to what we call the fitra which we speak on about i'm not sure if it, it's, it's, you, yeah um Pla plantiga calls it basic beliefs so when we refer to a priori in the context of theism we're not speaking about those biological things because it, it's clear he does here's that. Where, that's what he made his that's career right. on. Sorry, here's yeah. where we disagree. I think you are. I think that this is a synthesis which should be happening and isn't happening, the differentiation. You're standing on common ground, and Mohammed Hijab and Peterson both actually agreed on that common ground. That we're all in a camp of people who are not postmodernists, who don't believe in a blank slate. From that, it logically follows we are people who believe there is an objective truth. Yeah? Just because I can't pin it down, just because you go, do you know what God is? I may not know exactly what the nature of any given objective truth is, but because I'm an a, I have an a priori nature, I can nail down there must be objective truth out there and hopefully objective morality. That's the platform I come from. So the objective truth out there, it depends upon how you define truth because the way he defined it is the story of Cain and Abel, according to Peterson, would be objectively true. If you speak to an average Muslim or Christian, when they say we believe in Cain and Abel's story being objectively true, they mean literally there was a Cain, there was an Abel. But when he says objectively true, he means it's happening right now, it's because right. corner is happening throughout right. history. This is and where we need issue. again to define our terms and see whether we're going to agree in a differentiation between facts and truth. Nietzsche made this distinction. Um, Peterson would make this distinction and I'm very much with it. There are dead facts which have no values and no meaning. And the minute you add a value to a fact, I would say it becomes a truth. Yeah? It's a personal evaluation. Hence, truth can exist in fiction. Now, the fact that you don't think truth can exist in fiction, I really find surprising. If you've never read a work of fiction where a character did something insightful and it, it, you saw in that it so revealed to you a truth um, about human nature. Romeo and, and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet. Or Tristan and Isolde, right? These stories are, they, they go around, you know, they're, they're often all over literature. They, they prop up um, in different cultures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. The, the idea of Romeo and Juliet then, and the idea of fighting, like two yeah, factions fighting just because yeah, it's history, it's not 